what I'm about to share with you from my heart and not only from my heart because I genuinely believe you cannot walk with Jesus for longer than a decade without experiencing disappointment of seeing people that you look up to, people that lead you, people that you trust, people whose books you read, podcasts you subscribe to, without experiencing at least one or two disappointments with spiritual leaders. Some of those leaders might not be spiritual leaders at church. They could be someone in your home, your father, or maybe a mentor or a coach that as a young believer helped you to go from point A to point B. In fact, they were instrumental in forming your spiritual character. And then you cannot be a Christian for a long time without encountering this, what I'm about to share with you. When you discover facets of their life, whether an accident or God exposes that or it becomes a public scandal and now your personal faith is shaking to the core because here is a person you aspire to be like and you find out they are a fraud, fake or they have more problems and they're not real. What Ted does to many people is it throws them into whirlwind of confusion. Now my personal experience and I've experienced about this about maybe three times or four times in my young Christian life. One of them was happened about 20 years ago when our church started here. We, I was listening to this one person who was from a different country and he was very influential in the country where God was using him. He was making a huge difference in that country and God used him powerfully to set people free from sickness and grew a massive church. As a young believer, my prayers were inspired by him. I would start doing all night prayer meetings because of this particular minister because I was so encouraged by his dedication to Christ. He led so many people to Jesus and if I mention more details, some of you will know who I'm talking about. He had the largest church at one time in that part of the world. Not a nation, but the part of the world that I'm referring to. And then later on it came out that there was a lot of other things that this person was doing. They were ungodly, immoral and it became a public scandal and most people found out about him when he fell not when he was used by God. It was disappointing. I was like, if this happened to someone that prays a lot, fasts a lot and leads many people to Jesus, what chance do I stand? What if that's going to happen to me? I'm a young leader. And I remember seeing someone else that this happened to, someone else that this happened to, someone else that this happens to. And more and more things come out like that where we begin to experience. Some of those people we had in our church before and then we find out that they're not lo no longer walking in righteousness and holiness and, and they kind of went off into a deep end. Some of those people we maybe even went and visited before, saw their conference, posted a photo, say what a great conference. We received such a, gr a great blessing of God and years later we find out they're completely into a deep end and off the rails. Now this is probably you're going to hear this message one time in 20 years the Hungry Gen but this is that time. I'm going to share something with you that I believe is going to be instrumental to help you grow through that and come out of that and become better Christian, not become a bitter Christian. Amen. Amen. Amen? You know, when you know how the sausage is made, you don't like to eat it. <laughs> when you stay long enough in the church and you see the drama, you see the politics, you see the, you see the, the faultiness, the fragility of people, you see the weakness of, of people, especially people in leadership and especially the ones that kind of become famous and, and big. I remember like when I was, you know, just a few years ago listening to Ravi Zacharias and just, just weeping, listening to such a powerful messages and you know he dies and then the reports come out, the investigation comes out about his life and what he actually was doing behind the scenes and it's, it's devastating. It's heartbreaking, it's confusing. In a Slavic circle, in a Russian circle, there's a, a minister that just, you know, got exposed and stuff just came out that everybody kind of really admired and he looked up to. He, he was used powerfully by God. And then we begin to reconcile, how can someone prophesy and their prophecies are accurate, lay hands on the sick and people get 
healed and there are medically verified miracles happen and then you find out this person practiced homosexuality, abused drugs, slept with prostitutes and you're like how can that work? And then of course we begin to look at every person who is used by God and say well he must be like that guy too. Where do we find a healthy balance that we don't demonize everyone God uses and we don't idolize everyone that God uses? Where do we find a healthy balance where we don't glorify miracles but we also don't dis, dis, dis on miracles because miracles for us is a testimony but for young lady that's her life. Miracles are not a show. Miracles are not for applause. Miracles change somebody from health to, from, from sickness to health, from living a short life to living a long life for the glory of God. For a blind Bartimaeus, it changed his whole life. From dead Lazarus, it changed his whole life. Miracles are essential and they're important. But while miracles are important and we hear about them, we read about them, we believe for them, we need to keep few things in mind about miracles that are very important. If we don't and we have a flawed framework by which we operate, when these things will happen, and my friends, I'm going to tell you, they will happen. It will destroy your faith at foundation because your faith was built with the wrong framework. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, now we will not have notes for this because this is just coming out fresh off the press. <laughs> All right. Number one, miracles are a sign that God is good. They are not a confirmation of ministers integrity. Let me say that again. Miracles and wonders blessings and breakthroughs. Maybe your dad was a successful businessman. Perhaps your coach was an incredible coach or a teacher, a pastor, a minister that you followed or follow and you're seeing an incredible gift, moves you to tears, challenges you to pray, moves you to purity and righteousness. You're like, man, this must be a man of God. Yes and no. Yes in the sense that it is God's goodness and God's mercy. Do not rush to connect a miracle, blessing or a breakthrough as a validation and stamp approval of God on this person's life, integrity, privacy and their character. Are you with me? The first miracle healing that happened in the Bible happened when Abraham, the Bible says, he lied about his wife. And then the Abimelech gets a dream from God to ask Abraham to pray for Abimelech's wives who were barren in his court. Now that should confuse you just a little bit. How is this guy can be used by God when he just found himself in um, a shady situation? And the Bible says God healed those women when Abraham prayed. That didn't confirm Abraham's integrity. That confirmed God's mercy. Never mistaken God's goodness for someone's character. Have you noticed when Jesus healed in the New Testament? We never see Jesus says, because of your fasting you are healed. Have you noticed when Jesus healed in the New Testament? He didn't say, because of your moral upstanding you are healed. He always said, because of your faith. In fact, some people who were healed had no goodness whatsoever. That's why the Bible says the rain falls on the good and the bad. God is gracious. God lets His sun shine on everyone. God can let His breakthrough just touch everyone. You may say, but why would God do that? Because the goodness of God leads men to repentance. God hopes that when I give Him good to you, when I give you mercy, when I give you a miracle, it can lead you closer to me. That's why the Bible says Jesus rebuked cities where most of His mighty works were done, they did not repent. Meaning they experienced a miracle. They said, oh God must be pleased with me. Jesus says, no, He is not. He's asking you to repent and that's why He's showing you a miracle to draw you closer to Himself, not to confirm the lifestyle you're currently living. Never mistaken God's breakthrough in your life as His approval of your life. Oh come on somebody, that, that could go on Twitter right there. <laughs> Write this down. I might need to write this down myself. Never mistake God's breakthrough in your life as His approval of your life. God's breakthrough, sometimes it's actually because God sees you're in sin and hopes to bring you to repentance. You may say, but God always convicts us to bring us into repentance. Yes, 
But the Bible says it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. The Bible says when it comes to Ahab, Ahab was one of the worst kings in Israel. And the scripture says, the prophet comes to Ahab and says, an enemy is coming against you and the Lord will have grace and you will have a victory. And this is the verse that it says there. It says, so that you will know that the Lord is God. Meaning God says, I'm just going to bless you so you know me. Ahab, the guy who was bad boy. His wife, you probably don't know a lot of people's wives in the Bible. You know his wife. We have videos on her. We preach sermons on her. Her name is Jezebel. This guy was as bad as they come and God gives him a breakthrough in his life for one reason, that he will know God. How could a good God be good to somebody so bad? That's why never mistaken God's goodness as an approval. It's an invitation to know Him more, to repent, to draw close to God. That's why Jesus said, people will go and do these wonderful things in my name. And Jesus says, but they don't practice righteousness. And I know this is hard for us to comprehend. How can someone do this and not love Jesus? It's easy. Many times they started loving Jesus. And deceitfulness of sin, previous traumas, sinful influences. And because they were getting away with it, they thought that as long as the ministry is growing, books are selling, people like me, I feel good when I minister. You know, everything is fine. God must be pleased with me. And instead of repenting, what they did is they started to look for a relief and they started to become better at covering their sin than confessing their sin. And they, you may say, but these people, they had a, a board in their life. They had a covering in their life. They had an accountability. See, you have to understand one thing about the human heart. It, it is sneaky. And the higher you go with God, the more sneaky you become. When you're young, your, your heart is like a baby skin. When you get, grow older, you can learn to trick other people. And the worst part is when you start tricking yourself into thinking, I got away with it. Nobody saw it. Achan, you know, put the stuff under his tent. They still won the victory. God must be okay with it. Why? Because he wouldn't bless me if he wasn't. And that line sets in. And so now instead of repenting, seeking help, we simply keep on doing it and we say, I'll manage this. I, I got this under control. It's okay. But see, the problem with sin is sin is a snake. No matter how much you pet it, it's still a snake. And it grows in the dark and then it bites. How can someone be used by God in powerful way and not please Him? Well, it's simple. Paul tells to the church of Corinth, who the Bible says lacked no spiritual gift, meaning they had all the gifts functioning at full capacity. But read the book of Corinthians. You're thinking he wrote to the church in Las Vegas. I mean, literally, one chapter, one guy is sleeping with another person, another chapter, they're fighting. You're like, this is one of the most immature, perverted, twisted, per bad churches. Of, this is the bad church of the New Testament. How could gifts flow so freely there? Because this is what the church has taught us wrong. And you probably have heard this. We need to get holy and righteous and then the power of God will move through us. How many of you heard that? How many of you have said that? It is not a complete statement. I'm not saying it's 100% wrong, but it's not a complete statement. Why? Because if that would have been complete, why did the gifts flow freely in the church of Corinth when there was sexual immorality, when there was disunity, when people were suing each other and there was literally every fleshly thing in the church of Corinth and the power was moving. That tells me God's power doesn't move through character, it moves through faith. And some people have a lot of faith and very little character. And some people have a lot of character and no faith whatsoever. And they're polishing their character, polishing their character and the power is not moving. Not because the character is not polished, but because their faith is not released. So what does this mean? Do we ignore character and just activate our faith? No, that means we need gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit to function at the same time to be healthy Christians. So that we walk in power and we walk in purity. 
So we walk in the gifts and we also walk in the fruit. That's why we don't say that at Hungry Gen. We need to fast so God can move. God will move because we believe He wants to move. We need to pray. We need to fast. We need to live in holiness and righteousness. But make no mistake. Holiness and righteousness and godliness is not a prerequisite to the power of God many, many times. Look at the church of Galatians. Paul writes to Galatians, he said, you went away from simplicity of the gospel into the law. And then he uses this question. He said, he who does miracles among you, he said, does he do it through the obedience of the law or through the hearing of faith? Meaning, does God do miracles in your midst because you're holy? Or is it because you believe? Paul is answering that question. He says, he doesn't do it because you're holy. But see, the Western Christianity has taught us that this, the reason why God is not using you because you're not holy enough. That's not true. At least not completely true. And the reason why God is using you is definitely not because you're holy. Sometimes it's because you're hungry. Sometimes it's because you have faith. And sometimes because God is just good to the people. And honestly, you have boldness and you have this faith and God uses you. But that does not mean Jesus is pleased with you. This is not to scare anybody, but this is to warn us as Christians that when you see a man of God prophesy paint off the walls and, and gets people out of wheelchairs, when you see us being used by God in the way that we see medically verified miracles, we see God just setting people free. Please hear me loud and clear. This is not God's stamp of approval on our life and our teaching. People can believe for a miracle in their family, God does a miracle and they cheat on their spouse. And, and they live in an alcoholic lifestyle. This is not a confirmation. And when we understand this, this simply helps us to say, Lord, thank you for the miracle. We believe in miracles. We want to see miracles. But God, we want to live in a way that glorifies you. Live pleasing to you. And we're not impressed with somebody who either has gold dust, gold teeth and, and prophesies and heal the sick. We're not impressed with that because the tree is judged by its fruit. Not Instagram likes. Amen. The second thing that I want you to remember is this. It's the devil's goal to allow a minister to rise as high as possible. Because the higher he gets, the bigger will be his fall. Why wouldn't this person who had a secret sin and lived in it be allowed to climb the ladder of influence and impact more people and not be exposed right away? There's two reasons for that. The one is the devil does not want him to be exposed and face the consequences. Why? If I fall from this, I don't get hurt. If I fall from the ceiling, I will get hurt. If I fall from 10-story building, I will die, not get hurt. The devil knows if this person is influencing five people, only five people will be thrown into confusion. Maybe four of them will survive. But if this person is influencing 50,000 people and he falls from that, I can infect and affect 50,000 people. That's why we have to be very careful with how we overly honor the men of God who are in the spotlight. And we need to cover them more in prayer than covet their gifting. A lot of us, when we see somebody in the spotlight, when we see somebody becoming famous, when we see, and I'm preaching against myself right now as well. That's FYI. We need to pray more instead of develop this blindness to think that just because they're in the spotlight, they're invincible, they're pure, they're holy and all of that stuff. Because the devil is interested in them to get, for them to get higher so he can throw them off of that so he can damage more people. I'll give you a verse. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 14, it says this, the Lord spoke of David. He said, because this deed you did have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also who is born to you shall surely die. David commits a sin. High level of influence David had. 
And God comes to him and this is what the Lord says. He says, because you did this, you gave a cause for the enemy to blaspheme my name. He says, now your child is going to pay the consequences. What does this mean? The higher you go, the windier it is there. Easier to fall. And when you fall, you damage more people than you've helped on the way getting there. I'm going to say this again. The higher you go as a businessman, the higher you go as a father, as a mentor, as a leader, the more God uses you, the more people you're going to help. If you allow a hidden offense, bitterness, unresolved undealt sin. The devil is interested that nobody finds that out. The devil is interested that you never get caught until the right time. And when is that time? When you will reach your peak and he throws you down so he can embarrass you, your family, and at the same time destroy as many people as possible in its wake so that you can do more damage to people by one act of falling. And all the acts of rising. And that's why the devil waits for this person to run for a long time. And then he punches them. The third thing that I want to highlight is God waits so he can give this person, this minister, this mentor, this leader an opportunity to repent. But what I want to highlight is this. It is God who brings what's hidden into the light. We must understand is that God loves His children and He grieves over their sin. But God is a holy God. And the scripture says our God rewards the things that are done in private, publicly. He rewards prayer that's done in private, publicly. He rewards fasting that's done in public, that's done in private, publicly. He rewards giving. So our God pretty much what He does, He specializes in looking at private things and rewarding them publicly. And most of us stop there and we're like, oh yeah, this is great. I need to pray fast and give. Yes. But God also rewards publicly compromises that are done consistently, privately. Even if they are done by His children and it will hurt His kingdom. Why? Because God is a just God and He will expose things that are hidden and things that are secret publicly. No amount of prayer and fasting to stop that is going to stop that if we continuously sin and we continuously do immoral things. You may say, but it's going to hurt a lot of people. God is not going to do a damage control. No, He won't. His holiness is more important than what many people think about a minister. God is more concerned about His righteousness and His holiness than He is about what you and I perceive about a person. Now at first it will seem like I want to destroy your faith in man and women of God and people that are in the high places that are used by God. I don't want to destroy. I just want to shake it so much that you stand on God, not on men. And when your faith will be shaken one day that you know where to fall, that they are flawed, God is still good. And God is the one that accomplishes His task by exposing sin. Why? Because He rewards what's done in private. They chose to hide stuff in private. God rewarded it. Like look at Rahab. Rahab hid the spies. God rewarded her and she changed her future. Achan hid forbidden things and God rewarded it, exposed it by letting his family take the fall and Achan for that. So we choose what we do in private and God exposes it, brings it out into the light. And just because you did the prayer fasting part and God exposed it and blessed you, but if you keep on immorality, tax evasion, and you start cutting corners, and you're, you're practicing, you know, you're taking drugs, and you're seeing a prostitute, living in always in bitterness and offense, fighting, and you're domestically violent, all of this stuff, you can hide it under wraps for 10 years, 15 years, it will come into the light. The bigger that you are, the more will be the exposure. If you're small, it's going to go to jail big, you're going to be on the front of the Tri-City Herald. God causes those things to happen. Why? Because our God exposes what's in the dark. That's why we got to be careful, make sure we give Him something good to expose. Come on somebody. Number four, 
when we notice sexual immorality, dishonesty, deception, denial of core doctrines, bitterness, divisiveness, abuse of power, neglect of responsibilities, lack of self-control, neglect of spiritual duties. We cannot bury our head in the sand and pretend it's okay. Because God is moving. God is doing great things. We need to speak up, confront that person in humility privately, hoping for their restoration if they change. If they don't, we report to others who have more authority to bring correction and discipline. But most importantly, we do have to either distance ourselves or remove ourselves from that environment. And some of you maybe came from that church, you came from that kind of a family, or you came from that kind of a place where maybe you sat under a toxic, abusive, divisive, dishonest, sexually immoral, bitter, abuse of power, neglecting responsibilities environment. We don't say that God didn't work there, but somebody else also worked there. The devil worked there. Human flesh worked there. As a church, we don't create a cult here where you can never question things, where you can never ask questions. We don't create a lordship in our leadership where our leaders are lords and our church is a cartel. Meaning you can't get in without paying a heavy price of being made fun of, being publicly ridiculed and being cursed. As a church, we're a community of believers where voluntarily we decide to join. Where we support the mission of the church. Our pastors are our leaders. They are not our gods. Even if they walk in the power that splits the Red Sea and flies get healed when they walk, it still makes them human. We don't worship our leaders. We don't worship leaders God uses. We don't kiss the ring. They're not our kings. They're not our lords. They are brothers and sisters and, and, and our servant leaders whom God has appointed. And they're leading us in the right way. And when they take the wrong way, come on. And when they take the wrong way, we don't say, well, they know better. No, no, we all know the Bible. The Bible says you have the anointing that teaches you. Meaning we examine things with the Word of God. And when things don't sit right with God's Word and they don't sit right with the biblical orthodox teaching, we make noise. We say, this is not right. This behavior is not right. This attitude is not right. This spirit is not right. And when things are not changed, we pack our bags and we go we leave and that's not betrayal that's right thing to do when Saul was anointed by God and went rogue and start throwing spears at David David didn't see oh just an episode oh Saul just was under a lot of pressure just just the stress is getting into him if somebody shoots a gun at you that's more than just an episode and this happens second time and third time and he sends an assassin destroys David's reputation, divisive, manipulative leader. David, the Bible says, he left Saul's presence. He didn't disrespect him, but he distanced himself from him. Never stay in a toxic, abusive environment thinking, oh, but they're successful. Oh, but they're good, but I'm getting so much more out of it. You're also losing a part of your soul. And God doesn't want us to lose ourselves being in an environment that's abusive, destructive, and sexually immoral. And we're not oblivious, naive, and dumb. Burying our head in the sand and saying, no, no, this just, just, just can't be true. We don't want it to be true. But if there are facts that those things are true, we get out, we leave, and we move. Amen? Come on, somebody. Now, I'm going to mention one more thing about this. You can still receive a blessing from this ministry, person, and that blessing is not contaminated when you found out that this person or ministry or leader and author is not who they claim to be. Let me give an example. This is the hard one. So let's say that you came to a conference, minister prayed and you received healing. You find out later this person is a fraud. Not in the sense that they're an atheist, but they live very moral life. Is this healing you received, is that demonic or is that from God? Let's say that you were at the meeting and this person prayed and you received the gift of tongues and you found out later this person is living in adultery. Did you receive demonic tongues or you received holy tongues? Or let's say that you were following this, 
this author or this this person and you received impartation they prayed for you and you received impartation your life changed afterwards and you find out this person is not who they claim to be what you received is that to be questioned because this person was questionable that you found out later that's a very good question let me ask you a question let's say that Judas was the one that was handing out money to you when you were poor now you thought he was from Jesus' ministry so you trusted Judas you find out later Judas commits suicide was the money you received from Judas that came from Jesus' ministry were they contaminated and demonic or were they from God from God let's say you're Hannah you cannot have children and you come to the temple now you don't know about all these immoralities that are happening there you kind of hear some rumors but you're just so hungry for God you come and you're just weeping and you're saying God I want give me a child give me a child and then Eli comes in who's not a good leader and he's thinking you're drunk so he says hey go sober up you're like hey I'm not drunk I'm actually seeking God and then Eli just opens his mouth and gives you a prophetic word God will hear you everything is fine you're like thank you thank you priest Eli thank you man of God you go in you get a child you actually put your child in a temple system that later on you find out has been mishandling money has been sexually immoral let me ask you a question is the boy miracle you received from this place is that miracle contaminated because that place was not right or no if it is contaminated then you should cut out two books of Samuel from your Bible right now because they are inspired by God and Samuel was a man of God even though how the miracle happened the circumstances were not necessarily if you would know all the facts were not very good so what I want to encourage you is this while we're not oblivious naive and dumb we also have to understand we don't look to men we look to God when you come and you receive a healing and a minister prayed for you, maybe a hungry Jan or another ministry, and then you find out some down years the road, he's no longer maybe walking with the Lord. He deconstructed, deconstructed or, or left Christian faith. Or you read a book, listen to a song that ministered to you, you find out this person is no longer walking with God. In fact, even when you were listening to them, watching and receiving, they were already on the way out. This doesn't mean that what you received is demonic. You know it's kind of like a glove, I used this example before, is when you take a glove and you do some gardening and the glove rips, you don't go and undo everything you did because the glove ripped, because the hand used the glove. Things come from God and God sometimes can speak through a donkey. God sometimes can use an aunt and to speak to a foolish person. God sometimes can give a dream to a Pharaoh. The Pharaoh was, he, Pharaoh believed he was a God himself. God can reveal a dream, prophetic accurate dream to Nebuchadnezzar. So just because God used somebody, this doesn't mean they were good and it doesn't mean that that which God did was bad. Amen? Amen. Now, how do you personally process all of this? Let me give you just personally how I process it. Number one is I grieve. I don't gloat. When somebody crashes, when somebody falls, I don't gloat. I say, yeah, let's make a new video about this. <laughs> yeah, tell me more details. I want to know who, who, what, what did they do? Let's spread this. Let's tell this to other people. Hey, did you know? Did you know? We grieve. When Saul went off the rails and Samuel anointed him, Samuel didn't gloat. The Bible says he wept. It's painful. It's hard. You looked up to this person. You looked up to this individual. You, you read their message. You kind of hoped maybe to be like them or your children to be like them. And you find out that that's a disappointment. You're, it, it's heartbreaking. And it's okay to admit that. Don't gloat. Grieve. Number two. Heal with time. God told Samuel to fill his horn with oil after it was a season of grieving over Saul. Time will not heal you, but it takes time with Jesus to heal. It's totally normal for a season of struggle, doubt, and even skepticism to come in. And say, I don't know if I believe any of this stuff now. It's so hard. It's okay to that healing season, but if you stay in that season without Jesus, you will get infected. A wound that's not treated, a wound gets infected. 
if you ignore those wounds and you don't bring it to the scriptures and to the Lord and you redirect your focus Jesus I love you I trust in you it's you that saved me not this person it's you that baptized me in the Holy Spirit not that church it is you Jesus that delivered me from demons not that guy or this person it is you Lord so I refocus my life on you and God begins to heal you with time it doesn't happen in 24 hours. It might not happen even in one month. But if the time already has passed and it's been years and you're still on the fringes and you're like, I don't trust any pastor. I don't trust any worship leader. I don't trust any minister. I don't trust any man because of what was done to me. My friend, I want to tell you, you were not wounded. You have an infection. You didn't get betrayed. You became bitter. Betrayal is what happened to you. Bitterness is what happened in you. Betrayal is what they did. Bitterness is what you allowed. It feels like they took something from me. My innocence. They took my hope. They crushed it. No, no, no. What actually happened because you stayed with that is the devil gave you something called cancer. And that's unforgiveness. And you will actually become exactly the same person you hate. Because you received an impartation from the devil called infection of bitterness. So while you grieve, you got to heal. And the way you heal is with Jesus. The way I had to heal when I looked at these ministers is part of me was like, God, I'm not going to trust anybody. I'm going to delete everybody out of my YouTube, out of my podcast. Listen, I'm going to throw all the books and just keep the Bible. I'm done trusting men. And after that episode ended, I said, Lord, but wait, my uncle never did those things. He's my pastor. My dad never did those things. He's my spiritual mentor. But wait, I have other so many men of God around my life. Yeah, they don't have books, YouTube channels, but they have character. And then you realize not every plane crashes. You realize for every plane that crashes, thousands of them don't. For every man of God that collapses, millions of them don't. And God begins to heal your heart. And you no longer become, become drawn by the spectacle, by the chauvinism and by how great and how famous people are. You're like, you know, that, that's good. Praise God. But what I really care about is what is the fruit? What is their character? And you become wiser, not skeptical, but wiser, a little bit slower to trust. Number three, trust slowly. Common error is no longer to trust anyone in the position of any leadership. I will never trust any minister. That's your wound speaking. It's understandable. But that's exactly what the devil wants. God wants to heal your wounds and turn them into scars. Scars don't hurt anymore. But scars also carry lessons. Lesson is this. I give respect freely. I give trust slowly. I can respect you quickly. But I don't trust you quickly. Respect, listen to this, is given. Trust is earned. Don't confuse those. Just because you respect someone, you give them because of their position, accomplishments, what they carry, you give them respect. That's a gift. Trust is not a gift. It's an award they have to win. And if they don't win it, they don't get it. I respect you. I just don't trust you. So trust has to be earned. And any leader who demands trust from you without earning it, don't ever give that to them. Give them respect. But don't give them trust because trust is earned. If somebody hurts you, abused you, cheated on you, it comes back into your life, you can forgive them. You can't trust them right away. And if you are on the other side who did the sin and you come back, you're like, you, well, why don't you trust me? Well, you blew it. You messed up. You cheated. You broke the word. You broke the promise. The trust is a glass. You broke. You have to put it back together and you got to be patient with it and they will not trust you because it's the right thing to do. Forgiveness is not trust. Jesus forgave people on the cross. He says, I forgive them Father for they don't know what they do. He never trusted them again because after the cross you never see one conversation with the Pharisee. He just left them alone. Distance himself. Why? Because they never repented. It takes two to repent for the trust to begin to be restored. Don't buy into this lie by manipulating people who commit sins who say, well trust me now. How could I trust you? You broke that trust. 
And some of you are coming to Hungry Gen and it's going to take time for you to rebuild trust and leadership because of where you came from. Let us earn that trust. You can give respect, but don't give trust. Let people earn it and let them earn slowly. And that is not you being hard-headed. This is you being wise Christian, practicing common sense. How do I process it? The next thing I do is I drop a stone and pick up a mirror. My response to someone's sin can also be a sin. I got to be careful that I don't go beyond what God leads me to expose, rebuke or discipline. There were nations God used to punish Israel and some of them went too far and God ended up punishing them as well. Noah cursed Ham's son, Ham's son for exposing the nakedness of his father. Noah blessed Shem and Japheth for covering their father's nakedness. This does not mean, listen to me very carefully, that we cover somebody's sin. This simply means we don't go beyond what is wise in exposing, punishing and rebuking. Why? Because remember who you are. The Bible says handle other people's sins with meekness, remembering you are also liable to fall. Today it might be them we're throwing stones. Tomorrow there might be a stone party for you. Be careful that you don't rush to make fire off of somebody's mistakes. It's better to err on the side of mercy, grace. This doesn't mean we condone. This doesn't mean that we say no, this doesn't happen. And we reject the victims and we, and especially when we're the victim, we're like, no, I'm just going to cover it by grace. No, no, no. If that person abused you, if that person hurts you, they need to face consequences. But at the end of the day, please understand, you're not the judge, jury and the executioner. Never take vengeance into your own hands because when you do it, this is what's going to happen. It will not satisfy you when you destroy them until the devil destroys you. Give vengeance to God. Give punishment to God. There is the last day God will make everything clear and you don't want the same way you vent and want to destroy them for their sin. One day for God to turn it around and do that on you. Be kind even when people fall in your heart. Have mercy. And Jesus did this thing. Caught the woman in adultery. Yes, she cheated on her husband. Yes, she was wrong. Yes, she deserved to get a stone in her face. Yes, 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 yes. The law says yes, she deserved to die. But Jesus handed everybody a mirror and He says, take a good look at yourself. And once you did that, do you still have the courage to throw a stone? And most people when they pick the mirror, they drop the stone. This does not mean again, people don't need to face consequences. People don't need to be rebuked and they don't need to face the music. This does not mean that. It simply means as a personal vengeance, I gotta have a character. The moment I rush to pick up a stone on you for what you did, I gotta pick up a mirror. Be hopeful. What does this mean? Be hopeful. That means that God is raising up a generation of leaders and ministers and you're going to be one of them that are not going to end up like that. Be hopeful. Sometimes when you hear this, when you see this, it feels like everyone around is just waiting to fall. You know, I even have people in our church who said, Vlad, are you going to be the next statistic? I see you becoming famous. I see you becoming this and you're becoming that. And, and I'm scared of being part of Hungry Gen because of how God is blessing Hungry Gen. I know where that fear is coming. But it's important that we don't live in fear. We live in hope. And we live in trust in God. Shake off the dust and move forward. Our best days are ahead of us. When Moses died and failed to enter the promised land due to his sin, Joshua had to move forward. Jesus and disciples moved on when Apostle Judas committed suicide. You will leave a better legacy than the one that was passed on to you. You will be a better leader than they were. That's the word that I have. You might not be as powerful as they were. You might not be as famous as they were. 
but you will leave a better legacy. I speak that over your life in Jesus' name. That you will pass on a better blessing to your children than what was passed on to you. Maybe what your father left you was just not good and you're like, man, I don't want to do exactly the same thing to my children. And there's fear that's coming in. I'm here today to tell you that Joshua did bring people to the promised land when his mentor failed to do so because of their sin. And Joshua was a better leader in a sense. He brought people there where Moses failed. And you can bring your family. You can bring your cell group. We can bring our church to the places where God has for us just because the previous leaders or because the previous mentors have failed to do so for the glory of God. Why? It's not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit says the Lord. It's going to be God who will sustain us, it will be God who will keep us, it will be God who will raise us and it will be God who will protect us. I want you to rise to your feet. Amen. Did you receive something this morning? Come on somebody. Now some of you are like what? Who fell? What is Vlad trying to answer? Honestly, nobody. But do keep this message somewhere in the back of your head. Save it on your YouTube because you might need to visit. I can't tell you how many people walked away from Christian faith over this one issue. When what they saw, what they've experienced, they didn't know how to process that. And the devil used that to shake the very foundations of their faith. And I want our faith to be built on who Jesus is the gospel. We love our leaders. We honor our leaders. We love our parents. We honor our parents. But my faith is in the cross, in the power of the gospel. One day I will not be here. One day you will not be here. If God Lord tarries, another generation will come after us. Our desire is to leave a better legacy than it was left to us. We'll raise it up. And that's why while we're hungry for miracles, church, please understand, our church is about discipleship. It's about winning the lost to Jesus Christ. It's about raising the next generation. It's about developing a pace, not so we can grow super fast, but so that we can grow healthy for the glory of God.